The following program is brought to you in part by the film Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace. Welcome to another Leon Charney Report, and today we are sitting in the Knesset, which is the Parliament of Israel, and we're speaking with the speaker. His name is Avram Borg. You may recall about two, three years ago, we did a phenomenal interview with his father, Joseph Borg, who was a terrific man. I think he served in more cabinets than any uh, Israeli citizen. I met uh, Dr. Borg a long time ago when I was involved with Camp David, and uh, Benachem Begin appointed him. At that time, he's the Minister of Interior, if I remember, and then he put him in charge of uh, the negotiations between Egypt and uh, Israel. Avram Borg is his son. He's a man who wears a kippah, a yarmulke, or a skull cap as we know in America and he became the speaker but the interesting thing about his life is that he's with the Labor Party he's not with the National Religious Party or other parties that walk around with these yarmulkes and kippahs all the time and that's a, in my opinion it's a phenomena he is now <clears throat> leading his party in terms of becoming the chairman or the uh, party leader of the Labor Party which was sort of disseminated in the last election by Arik Sharon there are a lot of controversy in that party now as to whether there should be a unity government between uh, Arak Sharon and Shimon Peres, who's a titular head of the party, I would guess, and he'll probably tell you he should be the president of the party, but uh, there's a lot of conflict. So there's basically no leadership. He is the leading man, and I assume there'll be election very quickly, or I, I assume. I don't know. In this country, everything's uh, not that simple. Anyway, I welcome. Avram. Hi, Leon. Welcome to the Knesset. It's a beautiful office here, and it's a quiet day, and um, I'm an American. I came to visit you. Welcome to the Knesset. It's a beautiful town, beautiful country, in difficult times. Not too many Americans are coming. Well, not many Americans are coming, but uh, at least one point of pride is that I read this paper that reported about the uh, reduction of tourists coming to Israel, which naturally so in a situation like uh, the very hectic one we're having today, that uh, uh, Jews from all around the world uh, very minimally uh, cut their visits to Israel, minus 5% or something like this. And I think that this expression of solidarity is very important uh, for us Israelis and for the solidarity of the Jewish world today. Big problem today with the Maccabea. The Americans don't want to come. You can't blame the Americans in a way, uh, Avram. I live in America, and all I see is desperate, tough, tough pictures from CNN. I've been in this country for two weeks now. I've been out every night. I've been to the, the soccer game for 25,000 people. I've been in Man Auditorium from Mercedes Sosa. I've been all over the place. There's not one time I haven't been any place. People in America don't get that feeling. Even when I call my office, they ask me, are you okay? So how do we relax the people in America? The actually three sides to uh, to this coin with your permission the first one here the first one is these days they're executing uh, a man from Oklahoma who okay. in, who in one move actually killed 168 people which is much more than everything that happened in Israel in the last couple of years so when you take things into proportion you understand the issues of lunacy and violence and uh, and accidents happens all around the world the second one is even assuming that the situation is worse than Oklahoma or in a city somewhere uh, in North America there is the basic expression of solidarity so many people around the world Jews and non-Jews alike are so proud with the uh, re, uh, renaissance of uh, the rebirth of the state of Israel which is actually like an expression of modern redemption uh, uh, for those of us who believe uh, in these things in a situation like this remote control solidarity is not enough last year I had one child in the army this year I have two kids in the army next year I'll have three and a year after I'll have five kids serving in the army and everyone out there is so proud of my kids and actually in a very uh, um, in a very historic way I will say the security of the Jewish people is on the, sho on the shoulder of my kids. At least come and express your solidarity with us. 
No argument to you. I just think that uh, this has to be reinforced constantly because people tend to get um, they get very nervous, and uh, I don't know how to overcome that. Our program is not a Jewish program; we're a current affairs show, but uh, we think we ought to express that. All right, let's talk politics, because that seems to be your avocation at this moment. And by the way, um, I remember an interview with your father, and he talked about the reason he left uh, Germany at that time was he smelled the anti-Semitism. I've heard rumors now that there is a simmering of anti-Semitism in Europe. Are you, you feeling that at all? Do you, you get any feedback on that? Anti-Semitism in the world was not fully uh, erased and it exists. Nor can it be. Well, yeah. Maybe. As long as there is hatred in the world, anti-Semitism will be a chapter in the book of hatred. But when you look at the violence which occupies uh, so many elements and dimensions of our life, modern life, drugs in the streets, violence within the family, rivalries between different wings of, of, of political, uh, over political uh, differences and things like this, there is a lot of violence, criminal and others in our life, and anti-Semitism is one of them but I think that thanks to actually two things the first one is the very being of the state of Israel which repositions the Jewish world and the Jewish realm in the eyes of others and the very existence of the free world under the leadership of American freedom the dimension and the uh, and the uh, depth of anti-semitism is totally different in the generation of our kids than the generation of our parents and thank God it's like this Avram, this is a very, very tough question, and it's not a wise guy question, but I ask it a lot in Israel. Define for me a Jew. I'll define for you three people, with your permission, or three yeah. elements it's a of... a very important question, obviously. I'll define for you three elements. The first one, being a human being. I mean, how are you born? What are you? Are you an animal? Are you an anarchist? Are you a one who stands McVay way against the entire human being? So first you have to make up your mind, what are you? An animal or a human being? Once I'm a human being, I was born Jewish. I, I did not elect or select to born Jewish. I cannot even promise you, Leon, that if I was born, I, would have bo I was born to the uh, Dalai Lama that at the age of Bar Mitzvah would have converted into Judaism. I didn't choose it, but once I was born to be a Jew, that's my way of life, and then I'm an Israeli. And I would like to talk to you a minute about the equilibrium between my Jewishness and my Israeliness, okay? Yeah, I'd like to hear it. My Israeliness or my Zionism is actually telling me this is the expression of my people after so many years of exile and persecution and you know the bad luck that we've had in our history now we take our fate in our hands and we control our uh, uh, we control our fate and we do not want to be persecuted anymore this is what does that mean to be a Zionist this is what does that mean to be an Israeli my Judaism tells me that God forbid I got drunk I will get drunken by my power by my muscles, by my obs absolute responsibility in the sense of omnipotent uh, responsibility, and my Judaism will prevent me from becoming a persecutor. So being an Israeli is saying I do not want to be persecuted anymore, and being an Israeli Jew tells me and I will never become a persecutor. That's a good explanation. A lot of people get stuck on it, and I've asked it of a lot of ministers, by the way. Uh, and you are wearing a kippah, which makes you a religious Jew, or an Orthodox Jew, or a traditional Jew. How do you define yourself? This is a very, very Israeli definition, because uh, your question, my set of relationship between myself and my Creator is a very private one. Personal, right. It's a personal, very private one. It comes from the depth of my heart, it comes from the depth of my soul, it comes from the roots of my very being. But it's a very, very individual feeling. I need sometimes the community to express my spirituality, to express my way of life. But God forbid, 
if will happen to me what happened to so many others in Israel that my politics will corrupt my religion and my religion will corrupt my politics and therefore there is a wall of separation within myself between my individual spiritual self and my political one I once said in a joke and people didn't like this joke so I won't repeat it I just say it that I'm a Protestant Jew that the set of relationship between myself and my creator is an individual private uh, a responsibility of mine rather than uh, uh, the interest of gossip or bad mouthing depends where you're coming from of the rest of the world well that poses an interesting question I believe I asked it of your father your father was head of the National Religious Party if you're a religious Jew how can you make a political compromise in other words the buses might run on Shabbat in Haifa but they can't run in Jerusalem and I asked your father how he how he intermediated that in his own mind and he gave us an explanation but I'd be interested in yours there are many many dimensions to this question it goes from the individual to the collective just to explain if you live as a Jew in England or in Belgium or in North America you have responsibility for yourself for your family for your community as a Jew and then in the rest of the, in the rest of your time you are a general citizen right in Israel which is the only Jewish state around the world you have a responsibility not only for your individual communal affairs but also for the uh, uh, da, for the spiritual dimensions of the very being of the state what does that mean to have a Jewish state and here I will say the following I think that the positioning of the institutionalized religion in Israel is wrongly positioned I do not want my religion to be part of the political instruments and to be part of the political machinery and at the sense I do not want my chief rabbis my spiritual leaders my icons to be actually clerks and civil servants this is a top-down uh, authority I would like my rabbis to have a bottom-up authority I want them to grow from the community I want them to represent the elements within communal life social life cultural life which need this kind of sp spiritual input that gives them the authority of the people and this is what so is so missed in Israel and my arrangement is for your question is the following there are three four five elements that should be expressed at the national level to say we are a Jewish state for example the language Hebrew the calendar celebrating the Jewish holidays keeping kosher the, the Jewish dietary at the public kitchens and this is some kind of a civil arrangement around the issues of marriages and divorces out of agreement rather than out of enforcing you to accept my position R leave all the rest of it outside of the uh, uh, outside of the approach of politicians outside of the enforcing uh, aggressive power of legislation and leave it to the community to dialogue for people to find solutions for reconciliation rather than conflict and therefore I would like my religion to be part of the communal life rather than part of the political life of it I think it's important personally also and I think once you so therefore you're saying something very powerful here basically these the religious parties are in your Knesset here should not be espousing you shouldn't politicize religion it should be a community affair period I interviewed Rabbi Ravitz at one time I asked him the same question by the way and he was head of the finance committee at that point and he said to me a Jew is a man who believes only in the Torah under your expression personally you might believe in the Torah but you can't institutionalize it for the state can you I mean this is a this is the problem can you institutionalize religion in the state let's first begin I'm with, sure you've tackled these problems because oh, yeah. you're in the Labor Party and you were to keep up I, I so have fun with you on this one Leon within myself this division is a, has a permanent presence it's an right. omnipresence uh, dialectic uh, dilemma right. and um, I'm not a 50% religious person and 50% modern one. I'm 100% believer and 100% uh, uh, modern one, and therefore I'm 200% of a person. This is a different, a different synthesis. It's a mathematical. Equation. Yeah, yeah. Well, biologically <laughs> it's different, but spiritually it is there. People who believe that Jews should limit themselves 
to Jewish wisdom only, to Jewish heritage only, actually uh, ghettoize, ghettoizing themselves from the beauties of the world, from the wisdoms of the world, from the enrichment of our civilization and, our, and other civilizations, which takes thesis and antithesis to, to create the great Western world Judeo-Christian synthesis. And there were dimensions like Rebbe Ravitz and other ultra-Orthodox that always wanted the particularist element of the Jewish people say, we are there for our own only, and who cares about the rest of the world? There were elements within the Jewish people always, all during our history, who automatically, mentally, were assimilated and felt inferior in comparison to the rest of the civilizations around us, be it the Babylonian one, the Egyptian one, the Greek one, the Roman one, the Christian one. And there were always Jews like my father, like myself, like yourself, like many other people who said we are complete Jews and we are full modern people and we try to harmonize the two elements. And therefore I enjoy in this life, I enjoy the depth and the richness of Jewish roots and Jewish morality and Jewish experience and I enjoy nonetheless the beauty of the rest of the world. That's great. This is why God created the rest of the world. I uh, personally agree with you, and most of my audience would, but uh, would Rabbi Shach agree with you? The answer is no, but on the other hand, I do not agree with him as well. I figured that. And that's the beauty, uh, <laughs> that's the beauty of the concept of mosaic. The concept of melting pot is actually a very, is a very, is a very uh, aggressive one. I want to melt you into me. This is a very, uh, a very, in, a very intolerant, you say? Intolerant. Very, in, thanks, very intolerant approach. And I say, no, Leon, be Leon. Avrum, be Avrum. And then let's sit down and talk to each other. Whatever we have in common, we have in common. And we should develop it. And whatever we do not have in common, let's agree how to disagree. We agree. We, uh, you and I really don't have much of a disagreement on this. Uh, I think... Uh, Tradition in Judaism is very important, but when you politicize it, I think you turn off a You're lot doomed. of people. You're doomed, and, and no you, doubt. you cannot win. And the reason I'm, I'm spending so much time on it, because very few people can explain it. And I, I think it's, it's really fascinating that the leader of a future possible leader of the Labor Party will be wearing a kippah. That's, I don't think it's like Robin would understand that. I don't think uh, even Shimon Peres would understand it. Not a lot of people would understand it. I know these guys very well. And uh, it's a phenomena. It's a very interesting comment. It was not a question, it was a comment. It's a very interesting one. And let me leave myself outside of this and just be an observant on my own reality, if I can sure. have an extra body uh, uh, um, experience. It indicates something very interest interesting about the new Israel, about the Israel of my generation, which was not necessarily the Israel of my parents, or Shimon Peres, or Rabbi, late Rabin, or these people. They came from a different reality, and myself and my kids were living in a different, generation, different generational reality. And it actually indicates both on religious Zionism and on the secular Zionism. On religious, on religious Zionism, where I was born, where my father was born, when my sisters grew up and were living in the uh, realm of religious Zionism, it tells us we are observant Jews who function outside of the ghetto. They told us since day one, we want you to be part of Israel in the armies, in the military service, in economy, in the academia, in all of these places, unlike the ultra-Orthodox, which are building higher and higher right. walls around themselves in order to separate themselves and their kids from the world. They told us, be part of the world, the Israeli world and then the general world. It was not expressed in the political life. It was expressed in all the other, other dimensions of life. But this one, and here I come, and I'm not alone, but here I come and I say in politics as well, I belong to the world. Like in the academia, like in commerce, like in business, like in wherever. In politics as well, I'm outside of the partition line. On the receiving side, it's very interesting as well. You know, the fact that if by September 5th, the chairperson of the Labour Party will be an observant Jew, 
wearing a kippah and very proud of it, it actually tells to so many different ripples of the society that the labor actually disassociated itself from. Traditional Jews, Sephardi Jews, peripheral Jews, religious Jews, even Arabs tell them, you see, there is a new opening, opening here. People coming from a different walk of life, becoming this kind of walk of life. It's a mission. You're absolutely right. You would have even a greater duty. You would have the duty of synthesizing the right and the left in this country. It'd be, uh, if you do win, and uh, we'll talk about that later, uh, that would be an enormous win for the country in a sense because you would be able to bring it together. And it's been very difficult. I know I spent a lot of time with Yitzhak Rabin. He was a good friend of mine. And basically, he was an Israeli, and his Judaism was peripheral. It was Zionistic. And after the Six-Day War, a lot of the non-religious Zionists, well, they, they were land Zionists, so they had their mm. land already. Mm. So they got confused. It's Interesting. Like, well, that's exactly what Interesting. happened. Interesting. And we talked about it many times. So we had to cut for a break. We'll come back. This is fascinating stuff. We haven't even talked politics yet. And uh, we'll get into that. But uh, th this is important, I think, for all of us who try to define the, the ability of a person who is a, an Orthodox Jew and a political personality. It's very hard to do. He's been doing it, and he's been doing it outside the religious party. So stay tuned. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accord. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high. To have this courageous man and my close friend killed. Winner of the Telly Award for Best Cultural Program. Now available at select stores including Barnes & Noble and online at Amazon.com. Now get the book the hit movie was based on, Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels. Learn about the backdoor channel negotiations that led to the historic 1978 Israeli-Egyptian peace treaty. Become a witness to history and order backdoor channels online at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Also available at all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at iTunes or Audible.com. Relive history. Order backdoor channels. Leon Charney sets out to discover the true meaning of the Kaddish, the Jewish custom of reciting a prayer to commemorate the death of a close relative. Join Charney as he finds out the history of the Kaddish and how it has evolved. Reviewed as a refreshing walk through Jewish history and a book that deserves to be read by both Jews and non-Jews, The Mystery of the Kaddish is now available online at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at audible.com or on iTunes. Discover The Mystery of the Kaddish. Get best-selling author Leon Charney's latest book, The Battle of the Two Talmuds. Join Charney as he explores years of Jewish history to find out why and how Talmudic scholars and rabbis abandoned the Holy Land for the lands of the Diaspora. Learn about the power struggles behind the creation of the Jerusalem and Babylonian Talmuds. It's a book critics call engaging and enlightening, a book which will be of interest to people of every faith. Now available at Amazon and Barnes & Noble, or download the audiobook of The Battle of the Two Talmuds at iTunes or Audible.com. Available now over iTunes, Amazon, and Google Play. Leon Charney's cantorial CD in Disco Long. Listen as Charney movingly sings El Mole Rachamim and Charney's amazing rendition of a disco remix of Adon Olam, all sung in the incredible and individual Charney style. Also listen to the CDs on Rhapsody. Download Leon Charney's cantorial songs in Disco Lam, the disco remix of Adon Olam on Amazon, iTunes, and Google Play. Or listen in on Rhapsody, all available now. We're back. I'm Leon Charney. I'm in Israel, Jerusalem, in the Knesset with the speaker, Avram Borg. And we're having a fascinating discussion, but a very important one, about Judaism and religion and politics. And he is the speaker of the Knesset with the Labor Party, and he wears a kippah or a traditional skull cap. I noticed that it's a knitted skull cap. In this country, there's a differentiation now between skull caps. So what's the difference between all these uh, yarmulkes? Uh... By the end of the day, it's the same one God. Right. And different ways to... Michael Jordan's yeah, caps well, now, yeah. <laughs> There are many different ways how to express both your communal belonging and the way of aesthetics of your faith. So there are different ways. I love my kippah. It's my kippah very careful, which expresses actually um, 
the beauty and the colorful approach that I think I have taught God and God has taught me. Have you had any resentment in the party from uh, its, uh, its people about the fact that you're a, a religious Jew? Not, 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 not directly. It never comes directly. But uh, I think that what I succeeded to achieve and the Labour Party succeeded to achieve with me in the last 20 years of relationship that we're having together, and it's a, quite an affair, is that I do not represent the Labour Party as a religious person. I represent the Labour Party as each and every other member of Knesset uh, representing the Labour Party. And I represent my, represent my religion regardless of the Labour Party. I have a wall of separation between church and state within myself. And therefore, I'm a member of Knesset and I'm a Speaker of the House and I was the Chairman of the Executive of the Jewish Agency and I was the Chairman of the Committees here in the Knesset on behalf of the Labour Party. And I believe in God and I'm a traditional Jew and it lives beautifully together. How did your father feel that you were in the Labour Party? The last, uh, the last he told me before he passed away, he told me that he loves me. I'm so sure he, he was first he was first my father for family affairs and he was my father for spiritual guidance and he was my father for the uh, a chain uh, a chain of generation that he was the previous link and my kids are the next link and uh, he agreed with many of my uh, ideologies and many of my positions and remember at the time my father belonged to the left side who remembers now to the left side of the National Religious Party who for years lived and uh, uh, preached for coalitions between the secular elements in Israel and the religious elements in, in Israel because this is part of the inner strength. So I believe that in many, uh, in many ways I continue my father's way in a, with different instruments because politics by the end of the day is just instrument and the goal of the betterment of the Jewish people, the strength of the state of Israel, the unity of the people from within, and dialogue instead of a conflict are actually the same messages, the same uh, shared value language that I had with my father, which I try to have with my constituency these days. Igor Amir used the Torah, or statements from the Torah, to assassinate a, a prime minister. Mm. How did you feel viscerally? Hmm. I felt responsible. Really? Yeah, I felt responsible. I didn't like people who said, this is not Judaism. This is making life very easy. It's like telling the Nazis were not human beings. No, they were human beings. And therefore the challenge on, on us to prove that something like this will never happen again within human, the human family is much more, uh, uh, much more difficult. When I come to Yigal Amir, I will say two things. The first one is, in a civilization which is 3,500 years old, you have everything. You have Kabbalists and you have rationalists. You have individuals and you have communal people. You have radicals to this side and radicals to the other side. And for every turn that you take spiritually, you have some references in the books and sages which supports your position. That's the beauty of such a rich, wide, and deep right. civilization. Right, you can rationalize any position. Everything. Then it comes to the responsibility. There are two kinds of, three kinds of Jews today. Those who don't really know about the Judaism. Those who know a lot about the Judaism, but they're robots. They're, never, they're not free thinkers. Right. They're not, they don't have the right to interpret. They're not free to express themselves. They are under the total authoritarian leadership of their rabbis. I do, not believe, I do not belong to those who do not know about the Judaism, and I do not belong to those who cannot express the freedom of their Judaism. I belong to religious Zionism, which loves its Judaism, knows its Judaism, learns its Judaism, but feel responsible for the decision taken within Judaism. Sometimes I take the decision privately and individually. Sometimes I do it with you, with my community. Yigal Amir is coming from the same school of thought, an individual who makes decisions within Judaism. I feel awful because the decision he took was an awful decision. It's a decision which stand, stands against the very basic commandment of thy you shall not kill. 
It stands against the very basic of Judaism, that you shall love your friend like yourself. It stands against the essence of Judaism, that you shall not do to your friend what you hate uh, to be done uh, 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 upon you. He interprets Judaism in such a different diabolic way than mine that it's very difficult for me, but I know it's part of Judaism and therefore I have to fight him. What was the long-term effect? We still don't know? I do not believe that actions like this can be interpreted even in the cyber timing that we're having, that everything is so I, I agree quick. With you. I agree with you. I'll give you an example. We were expelled from Spain some 500 years ago. It took us 500 years to understand what happened and to build the state of Israel. The Holocaust was 60 years ago. We do not even begin to understand the trauma. So it's, I can tell you one thing for sure. Long run, long run, I have no idea. United States of America did not yet overcome the assassination of JFK. I don't think they overcame the assassination of Abe Lincoln. Okay, even <coughs> deeper, even deeper. And this is 100 years ago, right. dozens of years ago, and this is only five, six years ago. The trauma is there. People understand, I hope people understand, the words can kill. And even in a political dialogue, you should, you should never push the envelope too much. I agree with you. Uh, once I was asked to debate the Rabbi Meir Kahana on television, mm. the Irv Kupsnit show in Chicago, and I said to him two things that I knew. I, I was a uh, roommate of his brothers, and I said, Love thy neighbor as thyself, and derech eretz kod mala Torah. That's right. Cur he, courtesy yeah, advances. Respect, uh, respect, uh, yeah, respect comes before the Torah. That's right. Which I think is your, uh, your way of no life. No doubt. He went ballistic, and he hmm. started to squink his eyes, which is his nervousness. And after the show, he came over and he says, you know, we're great together. We should go on tour. So there was the, the authenticity of No, this. I don't like it. Was, it. it was a joke. Igor Amir was very authentic, bad, malicious, right. but very authentic. And it's our responsibility to overcome the Amirs of the world. It's amazing that you take responsibility. Yeah, it's, it's my important. Torah. I'm responsible for my Torah, even for the negative dimensions of, of, of its interpretation. That's my responsibility as a Jew. We're going to cut for a break, but what I say about Avram Borg is you go to a hospital in New York today, you see a guy with a kippah as a surgeon, he doesn't interpret his surgery through religion, he does it through medicine. You do your politics and you separate your religion. It's the best metaphor I can give you, and I think he's done it rather well. We'll be right back. Don't leave us. This is hot stuff. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accord. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high to have this courageous man and my close friend killed. Winner of the Telly Award for Best Cultural Program. Now available at select stores including Barnes & Noble and online at Amazon.com. Now get the book the hit movie was based on, Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels. Learn about the Backdoor Channel negotiations that led to the historic 1978 Israeli-Egyptian Peace Treaty. Become a witness to history and order Backdoor Channels online at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Also available at all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at iTunes or Audible.com. Relive history. Order Backdoor Channels. Leon Charney sets out to discover the true meaning of the Kaddish, the Jewish custom of reciting a prayer to commemorate the death of a close relative. Join Charney as he finds out the history of the Kaddish and how it has evolved. Reviewed as a refreshing walk through Jewish history and a book that deserves to be read by both Jews and non-Jews, The Mystery of the Kaddish is now available online at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at audible.com or on iTunes. Discover The Mystery of the Kaddish. Get best-selling author Leon Charney's latest book, The Battle of the Two Talmuds. Join Charney as he explores years of Jewish history to find out why and how Talmudic scholars and rabbis abandoned the Holy Land for the lands of the Diaspora. Learn about the power struggles behind the creation of the Jerusalem and Babylonian Talmuds. It's a book critics call engaging and enlightening, a book which will be of interest to people of every faith. Now available at Amazon and Barnes & Noble, or download the audiobook of The Battle of the Two Talmuds at iTunes or Audible.com. 
Available now over iTunes, Amazon, and Google Play. Leon Charney's cantorial CD in Disco Long. Listen as Charney movingly sings El Mole Rachamim and Charney's amazing rendition of a disco remix of Adon Olam, all sung in the incredible and individual Charney style. Also listen to the CDs on Rhapsody. Download Leon Charney's cantorial songs in Disco Lam, the disco remix of Adon Olam on Amazon, iTunes, and Google Play. Or listen in on Rhapsody, all available now. We're back in a fascinating interview with Avram Berg, who is uh, a Labor Party, uh, I guess he's on his way to becoming the chairman of the Labor Party. A fellow named Fuad might disagree, but, you know, that's life. But so far, it looks like he's going to be there. But more importantly, and or as importantly, is the fact that he wears a keeper yarmulke and he's synthesizing Judaism and Israel, which is very hard to do. And if he does win, it'd probably be a hallmark in the state of Israel's history. Avram, why did uh, Barack lose the, you know, he, he was disseminated. I mean, you guys, he was your leader, and you guys got wiped out totally. Do you rather talk about Judaism? <laughs> no, 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 that's my Israeli part. <laughs> it's a good, listen, there, there, there are many explanations. That is not a, this is not one. I'll try to give you, I'll try to give you three, with your permission. Barack is a very, very talented person. A very charismatic leader, very comprehensive approach, a lot of knowledge. He's good. He's, I'm tell, I was not his friend, but I'm telling you, he's very good. One of the best we've had. We, I think we had, under Barack, <clears throat> three failures. The first one was the personal rela relationship. How you treat your people, okay? He was a loner? He was too much of a loner, coming after Netanyahu, who was too much of a loner. And this is not what the country needs now. The country does not need one loner, to do one ride, lone rider to do it all alone. The country needs a good coach that will take all the elements of, of the society and actually make a team out of the society again, at the political echelon and at the social communal infrastructure. So this was one. The second one was Jerusalem, and this is very important. I'm coming from the peace camp, and during Camp David, I told him, Mr. Barak. Camp David too. Camp David too. that's right. Mr. Barak, you cannot approach Jerusalem <clears throat> like an Israeli. You should approach it as a Jew as well. Because this square kilometer, or square mile within the walls, the Temple Mount, the cemetery of Mount, uh, of, Mount of Olives, this is the nuclear reactor of Jewish history. Be very careful when you walk into a nuclear reactor, don't walk unprotected. What did he say? He walked unprotected. <laughs> he didn't listen. And this was a mistake. We need peace between us and the Palestinians. There is no future to the region without historic reconciliation between us and them. But if there are elements like Jerusalem, which is sacred for them and sacred for us, like the right of return, which is important for them and dangerous for us. Elements like this don't pretend to solve issues of hundreds of years of conflict in couple of days solutions. Leave it for later stage. Leave it for better confidence after confidence building periods and time that I know you and you know me and you the Palestinian have something to lose and me the Israeli has a lot to lose then we shall sit down on the burning issues that was the second element and the third element has to do with the identity of the society Israel is at the edge of a very very difficult time of totally disintegrated Religious for their own, Arabs for their own, uh, uh, right-wingers on their own, Russians on their own, veteran Israelis on their own, Ashkenazim, Sfadim. In times like this, you have to be very sensitive. You, have, you, you cannot ally yourself as the father of the nation or the elder brother of the nation. And this is what the prime minister is, either the father of the nation or the, or, 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 Arik Sharon is the grandfather of the nation, okay, or the elder brother of the nation. You cannot allow yourself as the one who is responsible for the family to make anybody feel alienated. And these three elements happen, and we have to learn 
to listen. You're very correct. I gave a speech. I got an honorary doctorate last week at Haifa, and I gave a speech about philosophy. I was now a philosopher, and I said the philosophy of life should be sensitivity and humility. Mm. You're going to have a great life. Yeah. If you import those two things, you're going to have a great life. All right, we know you're going to go out of time. I'm going to throw names at you. You're going to give me quick answers because we want to complete this. Yasser Arafat. An extremist, yesterday's extremist, today's rivalry, tomorrow's partner. You believe he'll still be a partner? I don't want them to decide who will be my leader. I do not want to decide for them who will be their leader. I, will, I would like to make a decent win-win peace between us and them. And I'm concerned because if we shall wait for the day after Arafat, it will be to deal with the Islamic fundamentalist, which is even worse. Is he in control of the uh, Intifada or not? I think it is. Aza Weissman, your friend and my friend, went to see Mubarak last week. Mubarak said no. Uh, before I got my doctorate, Bibi Netanyahu, your former prime minister, called me to congratulate me. And we talked about this a little bit on the phone, and he said yes. And the truth is in between. <laughs> it's a, intifada, is it crippling this country right now? Emotionally, yes. Strategically, no. There is no strategic threat coming from the Palestinians. There is a strategic threat maybe from the nuclear weapon of Iran, maybe from the Scud missiles of Syria and uh, uh, Scud missiles of Syria. There will be an existential strategic threat to Israel if it will be uh, uh, boycotted uh, and becoming the pariah of the Western world. With the Palestinians, it's painful. It's a lot of blood. A lot of suffering and agony on both sides. A lot of frustrations and misunderstanding. No threat. Arak Sharon, today. A surprise. A surprise. Go a ahead. surprise. Are you uh, basically supporting him through the Labour Party? Which end of the party are you? As long as Ariel Sharon is doing what I believe should be done for Israel, and this is restraining or pacifying or controlling the military uh, overreaction of the ultra uh, e extreme right wingers in Israel. And on the other hand, supports uh, permanent initiatives for peace on the side of Israel. We are partners of his. Israeli Arabs, the future for them? The future for them should be like American Jews, which means the most of Israeli, uh, of Israeli Arabs, which are 20% of the population, would like to feel that they have one state, which is their citizenship state, and one state, which is the national homeland, and there is peace between the two entities, because otherwise there is a cognitive dissonance which cannot emotionally uh, allow them uh, to function. Like American Jews love America, and they're the citizens of America, they love and are devoted to Israel, because that's the homeland of the nation, and they would like to have good, peace and uh, uh, good energy flowing between Israel and the United States of America. This is what Israeli Arabs should feel about the relationship between Israel and the future state of Palestine. Are you worried about the uh, demographics in Israel? No, I'm, I'm not worried. First, I have six kids. <laughs> so, from a very personal point of view, uh, I, uh, well, uh, well <laughs> come to me afterwards. <laughs> but yes, I'm in politics. Um, uh, but it is not an issue. It's, uh, it, has a, uh, it has a music of uh, almost a racial music behind it. These are the Israeli Arabs. We should grant them the same rights that we would like to be granted for Jews in Russia and for Jews in America and for Jews in Belgium. And we should think in terms of win-win. What's good for the society? What's good for democracy? What's good for them? And then it will be become good for us. Are you happy they changed the law about direct election of prime minister? I'm very happy. I think it was a bad law for Israel because it adopted the all the external make up presidential like elections of the United States of America without adopting the constitutional safety net which checks and balances the omnipotent power given to the presidential uh, uh, um, candidate. And therefore, this renewed system is better for Israel. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accord. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high. To have this courageous man and my close friend killed 
winner of the Telly Award for Best Cultural Program. Now available at select stores including Barnes & Noble and online at Amazon.com. Now get the book the hit movie was based on, Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels. Learn about the backdoor channel negotiations that led to the historic 1978 Israeli-Egyptian peace treaty. Become a witness to history and order backdoor channels online at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Also available at all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at iTunes or Audible.com. Relive history. Order backdoor channels. Leon Charney sets out to discover the true meaning of the Kaddish, the Jewish custom of reciting a prayer to commemorate the death of a close relative. Join Charney as he finds out the history of the Kaddish and how it has evolved. Reviewed as a refreshing walk through Jewish history and a book that deserves to be read by both Jews and non-Jews, The Mystery of the Kaddish is now available online at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at audible.com or on iTunes. Discover The Mystery of the Kaddish. Get best-selling author Leon Charney's latest book, The Battle of the Two Talmuds. Join Charney as he explores years of Jewish history to find out why and how Talmudic scholars and rabbis abandoned the Holy Land for the lands of the Diaspora. Learn about the power struggles behind the creation of the Jerusalem and Babylonian Talmuds. It's a book critics call engaging and enlightening, a book which will be of interest to people of every faith. Now available at Amazon and Barnes & Noble, or download the audiobook of The Battle of the Two Talmuds at iTunes or Audible.com. Available now over iTunes, Amazon, and Google Play. Leon Charney's cantorial CD in Disco Long. Listen as Charney movingly sings El Mole Rachamim and Charney's amazing rendition of a disco remix of Adon Olam, all sung in the incredible and individual Charney style. Also listen to the CDs on Rhapsody. Download Leon Charney's cantorial songs in Disco Lam, the disco remix of Adon Olam on Amazon, iTunes, and Google Play. Or listen in on Rhapsody, all available now. Tell you a secret. Isaac Robin came to me as a lawyer and asked me to check the countries of the world to see if there was any place where there's a direct election of prime minister. There wasn't. You were the only place. There you go. That had it. And still he supported it, unfortunately, but nevertheless. That's his past. That's right. Azmi Basharo, who is a uh, member of Knesset, and he's an Israeli Arab, and he was in Syria yesterday, and he made some remarks about. Uh, uh, Israel in the Syrian, uh, some kind of memorial meeting, I guess. What's your reaction to that? It's outrageous. It makes me very angry, but it puts to test my commitment for the freedom of expression and freedom of, uh, and freedom of association. So as long as it is being done within the boundaries of the legal system in Israel, i.e. it is not uh, betraying the country, and this is not on me, as a politician to check, but it is on the Attorney General and the legal system in Israel. I can be very troubled about it. I have to fight it publicly. I have to tackle it uh, uh, um, on the ideological level. But if this is what he feels, and it is still, again, within what the Israeli law allows, that's the price you pay for the freedom of expression. Shimo Peres is 77 years old. He's the foreign minister that's a very good beginning. of the Labor Party. Uh, if uh, you were to become the chairman of the Labour Party, would there be a place for Shimon Peres? Yeah, Paris? but of course. Shimon Peres immediately, the first uh, um, uh, action item that I, I'll have on my table, September 5th, is to nominate Shimon Peres as a lifetime uh, president of the Labour Party. He, his contribution to the country, his, his contribution to the, uh, to the State of Israel is such that we should be good people who are expressing their uh, 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 gratitude rather than being Eskimos, okay, who let their elder people just to uh, just forget them out there in the deserts of ice. This is not my way. This is not the Jewish way. All right. You feel a great uh, future for this country? But of course, but of course, you know, sometimes you draw hope from the future. It's a rosy, pinky horizon. Sometimes when the horizon is not very clear and the sky is cloudy, you draw hope from the past. We are the best generation ever. If I would have told your grandparents, okay, that Leon one day will have a TV show in America, will live good life, will have a fancy car. You have a fancy car, I take it. Okay. A good car, okay? No, I got a fancy car and a, a fancy driver. A, 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 okay, and you live in a good neighborhood and you're well respected by your people. Your grandma would have asked, what happened, Leon? Did the Messiah arrive? 
The same with my parents and grandparents. No, the Messiah is not here, but it's the best generation ever. And it's a very powerful thing. Yes, we have some troubles. Yes, not everything is solved. So what? We have great international status, great academia, which allows itself even to grant you uh, a doctorate, okay? Can you imagine how powerful we are? Which, you deserve it and you know it, but we have academia, we have international status, we have powerful army, we have very strong society, and we have some difficulties. So what? Previous generations had more difficulties than ours. We leave you with the great hope for this country. Hope uh, has to be tempered, they tell me. I, with my philosophy guys up at Haifa, they said, hope is great, but you can't raise expectations beyond too much reality. I think you're there. Thanks a million, though. Thank you. We'll see you next week with another show. I'm not sure we could talk about Judaism and religion. We might do Renee Taylor, who's going on Broadway.